All right, today I wanna to show you one of the most common electrical projects for DIYers. And that's you move into a house, you start kind of getting your living spaces where you want it, and you don't have an outlet where you need it. So how do you add a standard 120, 15 amp, or 20 amp outlet where there is no box, there's no outlet, there's no wire starting fresh. That's what we're gonna go over today. I'm calling in my buddy, Joe Walsman from Jefferson Electric to walk us through the complete project so you guys can take that on at home or just be more educated if you're gonna hire somebody to do the job. So we're adding the outlet, boom, right there at the homeowner's request in this breakfast nook, 1928 home, but we'll give you tips and tricks for older homes, newer homes and show you some different methodologies and we're utilizing simplistic tools. Nothing fancy and nothing specialized so that you can do this if you're comfortable with the codes and standards of your area and what it takes to stay safe. So we're cutting a new hole in the wall 11 inches above finished floor. The reason for that is because we're going to match existing. That's my recommendation to you. And before we start cutting holes in the wall and demonstrating exactly how to do that, how to fish your wire, how to navigate through framing. We're gonna go take a look in the basement to match this project to your project. Check the timeline, it's divided into chunks so you can look at the different chapters of the project and skip ahead. So we just came from upstairs where our outlet's gonna be located and it's gonna be approximately in this vicinity. We're gonna show you how to identify that between floors because that gets a little confusing. Then we're gonna bring our Romex wire down from above through the joist cavity and we're gonna drill the joists in a code compliant manner. We do wanna do that as opposed to stapling it to the bottom. Uh, that's a code issue, we'll talk about it a little bit more. Until we hit a junction box where we've identified a suitable 20 amp circuit to make our wiring connection. Let's jump upstairs, take a look at parts and tools real quick so that you're equipped and then go right into cutting holes, drilling, making a mess and getting that outlet installed. Here's our tools and materials for executing this project. We've got a hammer for our staples, a folding ruler could be easily substituted for a tape measure for measuring the height of the box, razor blade for stripping our wire, wire strippers for stripping the internal conductors and a couple other maneuvers we'll show you. Jab saw, easily execute this project with a $5 jab saw if you've got drywall. In this case, we'll be utilizing a oscillator because we're going through plaster and lads, so it's a heavier cut. We've got a 3 16 flathead screwdriver with a nice little blow out of the side. Uh, number one, square drive that pairs perfectly with your receptacle. Single gang Slater remodel box. Remodel because it doesn't have mounting nails, it has mounting tabs. Some other alternatives there that we'll demonstrate to you as well. Wire nuts for wiring terminations at the junction box. Wire connector for the junction box as well. Smallish drill bit, and that's a little secret right there I'm gonna show you later. Source of light so I don't get lost in the dark cranny of the basement, electrical tape for fishing my wire, and then really, in this case, I am drilling through older wood, so I've probably got a little bit of a, a heavier drill than what the average house that's built in the last 20 or 30 years would have, um, so I'm utilizing a DeWalt 20 volt uh, XRP drill. I've also got a right angle drill, which is going to help me out in the basement, but it's totally optional, and this oscillator again to facilitate my cut. The wire I'm utilizing is 12-2 Romex. That means it's got two conductors plus a ground, total of three, but it's called 12-2 Romex. And it is necessary on a 20 amp circuit to pair with 12 gauge wire. If you're running a 15 amp circuit, that would be 14 gauge wire. And last but not least, 15 amp outlet. You're gonna ask a question. 15 amp outlet, 20 amp circuit, is that legal? Absolutely, I'll dive into that later. This might look a little overwhelming. You can screenshot this, you've got a record of what's going on here, or you can check below the video in the description for a full list there and where to buy these parts. Now, time to cut a hole. So in this case, I'm 11 inches above finished floor to the bottom of my box, which puts me right at the shelf on the wallpaper. A typical home built today is gonna to be about 15 inches to bottom of box, but we're matching existing. That's my recommendation to you. And one of the most important things is this whole measure twice, cut once concept, right? So there are a few ways to go about this. Pull out your stud finder, find out where the studs are. This is a plaster wall with lath behind it. So there, my, a, a traditional stud finder is not gonna work. There are stud finders that are made for this purpose, um, but you can also, you can knock the wall, 
and listen. Use echolocation to find out where that stud is. Maybe you can check your trim for nail patterning and look for a 16 on center nail pattern there to identify where those studs are. But regardless, you wanna make sure that it's a check twice, cut once. In this case, I've got this wallpaper that the homeowner is doing some remodeling here. The trim is loose. So a bit of an advantage to me here. I'm gonna plunge drill before I actually cut the wall with this pilot bit. It's an SDS carbide bit. So it's gonna give, it's gonna last forever in uh, this plaster without dulling. On high speed, since it's a small bit. So that resistance was actually coming from getting through the lath because this is not a wood and metal bit. But look at that available depth I've got in the wall. That's beautiful. And I'm gonna just wiggle it a little bit side to side. Wonderful, with the depth of that bit and the amount of movement I've got, I'm in good shape. All right, I've got a good cavity there to work with. Box of choice today is a single gang Slater box. It's a remodel. You also have options for, if you've got drywall, a uh, blue Carlon remodel box. The reason I'm choosing the Slater is because if you notice, I've got a metal tab, not a plastic, and I've got more depth here than I've got on the blue Carlon box. This is really intended for old work in a drywall situation, but that extra space right there is magical when you're dealing with plaster, lath, and that additional thickness. It's not uncommon for that to be three quarters of an inch and to require the full capacity of this Slater box. There's also an option for a two gang box if you're installing multiple receptacles. This would be referred to as a duplex receptacle or a double duplex. All right, so now we've got bottom of our box at the top of the shelf. I'm gonna lay it to the wall in reverse so that I'm marking the outline of the box. If I've got a finished situation, it is relatively rather nice to utilize something like a mechanical pencil because then I've got the ability to erase and my marks are real light. Sometimes a carpenter's pencil is so aggressive. If you do get into the place where you've made an error, um, there's just a little bit more forgiveness with a lightweight instrument. As I mentioned in this case, I'm utilizing an oscillator. I'm gonna give you a trick how to extend the life of the blade. And if you're getting through plaster and lath with a jab saw, long hard day, which is why I'm using this incredible power tool that hit the industry, what, five, six, eight years ago, made our lives a lot easier. Uh, what I'm gonna do to extend the life of the blade is I'm actually gonna, almost like a hammer action, use the side of my blade to score the cut, and I'm gonna get through uh, my plaster. And, and there is some kind of drywall overlay I've got here, so I don't know how many layers of material I've got back there, but I'm gonna cut until I get to the wood with the side of my blade, and then I'm gonna turn and plunge cut. And pro tip is go slow, take it easy. Under pressure and a lot of force, the oscillator is not actually gonna perform. You'll put that blade in a bind. But if you keep lightweight pressure, it'll actually accelerate the cut. Here we go. So that's to be expected. It's an exterior wall, so we actually have three quarter inch security lad. This stuff is old growth, it's beefy. See that heat, that smoke rolling out of there? That's just because I'm using a dull blade cutting some good old hardwood right there. That's it. We have a good clean hole here. First time fit? No sir. It's a little too tight top to bottom, so we're gonna open it up. All right, we've got a good clean hole here. Watch out for overcut. The only thing holding your box to the surface on the front side are these four tabs. If you cut beyond that, project just became 3x more difficult. Let's figure out how to get that hole between floors and start running our wire. Pro tip, now I'm using this mysterious little uh, wood drill bit. 
and the luxury here is the trim is loose. So in order to identify my hole in the basement, I'm drilling straight down through the floor, below the box, and you can use landscaping flags or anything, but drop the, the blade of your screwdriver, anything works. I've got this wire nice and long, and I'm going to drop it in there. I'm hitting insulation, and that'll be my identifier in the basement. So now we're in the basement. We've taken the insulation out of our way uh, from the rim joist. We've identified where our hole is, so we know exactly where to drill up through. And we're not going to follow that hole. We're actually going to go two inches behind it, so we come up in center of exterior wall. And then once we're certain that we've got the wire up the wall and plenty of wire, then we're going to cut it to length, drill through our joists, and peel off across the basement. So you might not have this 90 degree beast right here that allowed me to get into that really tight space, but you could use an impact driver with a short bit or maybe a 90 degree angle bit on it. Those things are like eight, 10 bucks. And uh, also an alternative is using a standard drill and coming at it from an angle and actually drilling. If this is where you want your hole to be, you would come at the hole in front and drill at an angle, understanding that you're gonna just have to choose that angle so you don't pop out the outside of the house, right? I've actually done that before too. All right, let's get a plan of attack. Make sure we have plenty of wire. Um, if in this case, since we're drilling through the holes, we want our holes to be pretty well aligned, both in the vertical and horizontal plane, because every time there's a little offset, that will cause resistance on the wire pole, and it can fight you pretty good sometimes. So I'm gonna feed up through the hole, make sure I have plenty at my destination, the outlet above us, and then I'm gonna peel it back, cut it to length, make sure I've got 16 inches or more of excess, run the holes um, after I have a well-planned route, and execute. So we've just run our wiring through, pulled it out of the hole upstairs in the wall. Now we're going to map our course across the joists here, checking both sides of each joist to make sure we're not about to penetrate an electrical line, a gas line, and turn this project into a massive headache. Our destination is this junction box right here where we've identified a suitable 20 amp circuit. Let's rock. Staples of choice are these plastic staples. You can use the metal staples, they make multiple types. These are pretty universally available and they're real kind to the wire in case you start pounding like a railroad spike. Uh, you just want to secure the wire um, and you want to make sure that you don't actually um, deform the shape of the conductors at all. So uh, a lightweight hammer and a lightweight swing is all you need. And I'm intentionally leaving a little bit extra. Some of the guys, when they run wire, it's tight as a piano string. I want extra. This wire is right down the center of all these joist cavities. If I come at a later date or anyone else and runs a pipe, a duct, anything of that nature, and I don't have a little bit of serviceability, I'm doing a pretty big disfavor. but I'm gonna pull out some of that extra. I don't want that much. Here's our junction box. Our home run coming into this junction box is a 12-3. The 12-3 is distinct in that it actually includes a red conductor. That's our third current carrying conductor. This is a multi-wire branch circuit. We're not gonna get lost in the weeds there. That red 
is the distinct current carrying conductor, that third current carrying conductor in the 12-3 Romex. In this case, the red is going to service another circuit in the kitchen, and our incoming 20 amp circuit will be serviced by this black and white. The neutral is being shared between the two circuits. Not to get lost in that, the basic rules of thumb are these. Match your wire size to the incoming wire size if you're connecting at a junction box. Be sure that the circuit capacity is sufficient for the loads. What does that mean? Well, take a look at your refrigerator. Inside the door, for instance, there'll be a nameplate. And on that nameplate, there'll be an amp capacity. So we've got a 20 amp circuit. Let's say we have a six amp refrigerator and a 12 amp toaster. At this point, we're at 18 amps. So we're sufficient to have those two appliances on a 20 amp circuit because we're properly servicing the load. I've got a junction box here, I'm lucky, but you're probably gonna have to create your own. So a couple quick thoughts. One, you have to have a junction box. Wiring cannot be connected in free air. Two, that junction box has to remain accessible so that you can't just stuff it inside a wall and close it up. And three, the junction box has to be firmly secured to the structure with proper wire connectors for wire entry. All right, now let's wire it up and when we finish this up, head to the other end and wire up our outlet. At this point, I'm stripping my wire with my razor blade. I'm stripping eight to nine inches. I'd like every wire coming into the box to be relatively similar. It's gonna make matching up the ends of my conductors and making terminations simpler. Installing my connector. I want the connector to be tool tight, not just hand tight. It is super common for DIYers not to have a connector installed. Don't be that guy. The, the reasons for connectors are one, it's code. Two, these sharp metal edges on the box at some point are going to cause damage to the wire that may result in failure. Three, it's going to prevent infiltration of unwanted stuff, whether it's dryer lint, mice, whatever the case may be. I've seen all kinds of situations. Use that cable clamp connector and when you're snugging it down, bringing that wire into the box just a quarter inch inside the box. That, that is actually code, um, but when you're snugging, snugging that clamp down, don't death grip it. You can actually short the internal wiring because this is a metal clamp on a lightweight insulation. So snug it down. You want to get to the point where you can no longer move the wire in and out by hand. And really, no more than that. That's it. I'm going to match my whole gauge to my wire gauge to get a good clean strip that doesn't damage my conductors. I'm sharing a neutral on this multi-wire branch circuit, so I'm going to include all of them in that joint. My box is grounded with a green ground screw in there. All my grounds are going to be made up together as well. Grounding is common on this circuit. Um, and this is my hot feeding up to the outlet. Now, quick note, grounds can always be common in a junction box. You can put them all together, and if you have a metallic junction box, you wanna ground the junction box. So, rule of thumb is don't share neutrals unless you know exactly what's happening. This multi-wire branch circuit, because of how the circuits are landed at the panel, is gonna prevent overloading. So I've got my big boys here for my solar energy projects. I'm gonna pre-twist the wiring. To me, there's no debate. Pre-twist, pre-twist, pre-twist. I'm gonna get about three good wraps on that. I want a good, clean, tight finish, and I don't want any exposed copper on this hot conductor. I want a fully insulated installation. I wanna wait until I feel it snug up and these conductors start to twist back on themselves, and I'm not going the handyman route here. I'm not wrapping with electrical tape. This is a code compliant, properly installed electrical connection. At the end, I'm gonna tuck them all into the box here. I'll just leave it hanging there for right now. Now I've got my grounds together and I'm gonna tuck them out of the way, start on my neutrals on that pre-twist. I'm gonna match up the ends again, be real, real methodical. I'm gonna give this. So I'm gonna cap my hot 
conductor that's coming in and being unutilized, at this point, this one's not fed. So I'm tucking these out of the way so that, and they're properly capped, so it's safe, so I can energize this circuit. So when we turn this on, the circuit will energize, and that includes the red. This black's getting no juice. So we're safe, and we're gonna be inside the junction box, fully covered up. Now, because I've got a clamp in this box, code allows up to 12 inches along the length of the wire from the box for that staple to be secured. I'm gonna come up above the knot and below that knot. That's really hard in this old growth wood to drive these little lightweight staple nails into those knots. So I'm gonna avoid those, bring it up, secure it in. Oh, <laughs> there it is. Guys, you know what? I'm good to go. I'm gonna leave it right there. So now we're back upstairs. We're gonna put the outlet and finish off the install here. One thing to note on these uh, plastic boxes, they actually just have these tabs here. You don't destroy the tabs. Just, just pop them open so you can get the wire in there. And that's not gonna grab nearly as well as the metal clamp, but it is code compliant and it's all you really need. One thing I've done too, because I have so much wall thickness here, I've backed off my screws to the very extreme of the clamp so that I really, I'm, I'm gonna make sure that those tabs open up and they've got the clearance to do that so I get a good grab. It's all too easy for one of those tabs to get caught and not fully open. All right, that felt real good. And, and what you're feeling for there is you can actually feel that lever Give that quarter turn stop, quarter turn stop. So I know that it's opening all the way. And then I'm snugging down. I'm gonna remove a little bit of surface material right there. That's gonna, that's gonna fight me from getting a good tight fit. Then I'm snugging down and not death grip. Again, it's just these plastic tabs that are holding it in there. You'll definitely feel it. I wouldn't recommend a power tool at this point, too aggressive. All right. Again, I'm using my 12 gauge strip hole about three quarters of an inch. And there are different ways of doing this. I'm gonna grab with my needle nose and bend it over. Um, there's also a hole on here, which is not my preferred method, but some of y'all are gonna shout it out. There it is. Three quarters of an inch. Make sure that copper isn't scarred or damaged. At this point, I'm gonna use my number one square drive, Robertson screwdriver. This seats so well to my receptacle and I'm not gonna be stripping or, or dancing around on the device itself. So at this point, I'm gonna wrap my ground clockwise. All of these are gonna be clockwise terminations because clockwise is righty-tighty and I want that screw to pull my wire into it. Then my neutral, silver terminal for neutral wire. It is polarized. This is a polarized device. I don't wanna switch that. I've got a plastic box, so I'm really not worried about my other unused terminal screws, but I'm gonna go ahead and snug it down. And same thing on this side, black to brass, B to B. I can utilize either terminal screw, and I'm gonna snug it. I'm looking for about uh, 15 inch pounds. This is not a Torx screwdriver, but I don't, I don't go that far for an application like this. We, we know how to do that right. And then, tuck, not stuff, wires into the box. I do wanna make sure that that ground wire does not accidentally come into contact while I'm stuffing with my hot terminal. That has happened, it'll trip out the circuit. I wanna keep it tucked away from my hot terminal. And I'm gonna gently, gently fold it, keeping an eye, everything looks good. So here, here are a couple things going on right here. One, I do have to have a ground screw with my box. Two, I'm gonna show you that I can utilize the receptacle as it comes, or in some cases, the remodel box is out so far that I'm actually going to grab my receptacle, change tools, I'm gonna to break it across that score line right there. Twist it back and forth, back and forth. 
And what that's going to do for me, flatten that back out. I really don't have to do this, but you might to, in order to get a real flush fit. What that's going to do for me is it's going to allow this yoke to seat between the stubs to get a real tight flush finish fit so that the receptacle plate sits flush and it's not gapped out from the wall. Righty tighty, driving it in, make sure it's flush to the box and vertical. Next up, we're gonna test our work. The job is never done until you test your work. You'll see the outlet tester on top is standard, doesn't take any batteries, pretty cheap. One on the bottom actually gives a voltage readout. It's only a few bucks more. Link for both in the description below. So this turned out real clean, but if you're having trouble with alignment, check out this video right here for more answers.